If you will allow it this morning, I want to start out by making everyone equally uncomfortable. <laughs> Except maybe the people at the front might be a little bit more uncomfortable because it will uh, maybe cause physical discomfort as well as the way that everybody's going to feel uncomfortable. But when I ask you to in just a moment, I, I want you to turn so that you can look at other people in this room and, and not up this way. Those of you who are already back there and you're going to be looking this way, well, look that way or that way or something. Just not at me up here. All right? Go ahead and, and turn where you can see other people out there. And then I have, uh, keep, keep looking, I have a question or two or three or four for you. Keep looking that way. Do you see anybody you love? Keep looking. Do you see anybody who loves you? Okay. <laughs> who said? Do you see anybody that you don't love? Do you see anybody who doesn't love you? Okay, you can turn back around this way. Now, I think I asked four questions. Three of them, I can't answer for you. One of them, I know I can. Because there are people here who've been around a long time who know what the Lord's plan for the church is all about. And when I asked, do you see anybody who loves you? You did. I know you did. Because there are people here who understand... God's love and understand what God means to do in us with His love enough that everybody they saw today, and they could have pinpointed anybody in all of this room and, and said, I love him, I love her, whatever it might be. We're going to think about a passage this morning, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, that's been one that's had... Uh, at least a place in the back of my mind for a long, long, long time. And I have wanted to uh, preach about it, single this verse out for a long, long, long time, and have wrestled with exactly how to do it. It really fits this morning with what we've been reading about in the past week if we, as we are trying our best to get a grip on God's purposes for His church. And as we talk more about that tonight in groups together, here's what 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22 says, "...having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart." There are elements in that one verse about the condition of the church, thanks to God, about the character of the church, and about the big command that God gives to the church as the church. I want to work through the verse to see exactly how we get there. Having purified your souls is the first thing that the passage says here. Now, I want to use the several verses before this one uh, to help us get a handle on what is it that Peter means by having purified your souls. Every one of us needs to have purified our souls. Well, first, why would we say that? Back all the way up to about verse 13 in 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter writes, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy." And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each man's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. We're going to pause right there and let the words that Peter uses help us to understand the need for purification of our souls. 
It won't be hard for us to understand. When we pause and think about the kinds of words used, we'll understand our own need. Maybe we already do. The way we used to be, if we're Christians, the way we still are, if we're not Christians, is what Peter said there in verse 14. We're living in the passions of ignorance. We don't know what we ought to. And we don't know the one whom we need to know, most of all. So, Peter is encouraging in this passage Christians to be everything that God calls upon them to be and to do everything that God calls upon them to do. But when we're not Christians, for sure, we're just not oriented that way. Verse 13 says that our hopes to be set fully on the grace that will be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As Christians, being what Christians are supposed to be and doing what Christians are supposed to do, we think past this life. We think about the goal of it all from God's perspective. Where does God want me to be? when this is all over, and that's where we set our hope, and and that's what motivates us through life. And from day to day, it affects our decisions. But in the passions of our ignorance, that's not what life is about. Life might be about what I'm doing this week, or or what I I hope for next year, or, or some kind of material goal in this life. That's not what God wants to fill our souls. Our souls are polluted with stuff like that. Verse 14, Peter says, As obedient children to Christians, in the passions of of our ignorance, obedience is not what motivates us. Obedience is not what characterizes us. It's not about doing what God says. It's about doing what I want. And that pollutes our souls. Do not be conformed, he says, to the passions of your former ignorance. Think about another passage, and maybe you already are too, when you hear that word conformed. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. The ignorance in which we live apart from God just makes us like everybody else. And that pollutes our souls. Verse 15 and 16 talk about being holy in all our conduct. That is to be like God, who He is in His very character and nature. But in our ignorance, that's not the way we live. Holy would be the last way to describe some of the things that we do and some of the things that we say and some of the things that we think. Verse 17, we think about the judgment of God if we are are Christians. But in our ignorance, we think more about what does everybody else think. What will they think if I do this? What will they think if I don't do this? And that pollutes our souls. And so we all find ourselves in that condition. That's what humans do. And nobody here is different in their past experience in that way. Our souls are polluted. So so what are we going to do about it? Verse 22 says Christians are people who have purified their souls. But how can you and I do that? Well, we couldn't do a thing about it unless God had done something about it. Verse 18, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. See, when I was living in this ignorant way, I was living like people before me had lived and like people around me lived. God did something to ransom us from that. 
we might have begun to feel this weight on our souls from all the ways that we'd polluted it and trying to do something about it out of our own effort and our own ideas. The Bible says that God for Christians has ransomed us from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. Verse 18, And not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last time for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. So, we make a mess. We pollute our own souls. What can we do about it? Well, the best of our efforts aren't going to accomplish a thing. But God has a plan. And the middle of that plan is a man who came and and lived like we do, a human life, but he didn't live it quite like we do. He didn't ever get off to thinking the kind of things that we will think or saying the kind of things that we will say or, or doing the kind of things that we will do. He's one whom Peter will say in chapter 2, he just never sinned. Not one time. God's plan was that what we have done does not get us what finally we deserve. We have hope because we've been ransomed by the one who died in our place. Jesus who gave himself as a lamb without blemish or spot. And so, cleaning up this pollution in my soul is not my job alone. It's not a job that I could accomplish on my own. We believe in Jesus. We believe in God through Jesus, verse 21, who raised him from the dead. And so, our faith and hope are in God. So, verse 22, getting back there, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. Now, as we continue through the lesson, you may hear me reference some of these passages or more than these or all of them. This will help you keep up a little bit. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14 uh, echoes the truth that we found in this passage. How can my conscience ever be purified. Verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 9 says, by the blood of Christ. When we think about being purified, uh, we think about what a good man led by God said to a man who was at cross purposes with God. In Acts chapter 22 verse 16, what are you waiting for? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on His name. We can be purified in our souls. Our sins can be washed away by, the Bible says, our obedience to the truth. When we meet Jesus, we want Him to see us in obedience to the gospel. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. And that leads me to think about what Jesus said in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. So his disciples go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. But we can be saved by obedience to the gospel. In this passage, as things continue... Verse 23 says, Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God. And at the end of verse 25, that good Word of God is called the good news, the gospel that was preached to you. When I think about what the Bible says about being born again, I I think about a man who came from this group of men 
who really felt that they had found the answer to the pollution that gets into people's souls. They could do good enough. And they could do enough, they thought, to make everything right. Nicodemus was was one of them. He was one of the Pharisees who were so often uh, finding themselves at odds with Jesus. Because here was Jesus interacting with the people whom Pharisees wouldn't even have anything to do with. The tax collectors, the, the prostitutes, the people who had done all these things and, and lived in such a way publicly that everybody would point a finger at them and say, that's a sinner. Now there is a polluted soul if I ever saw one. But Jesus would bring those people near and Jesus would change their lives. But then here were the Pharisees who wouldn't touch people like that with a ten-foot pole and who felt, there's nothing wrong in my soul. I've got it all together. Well, this Pharisee comes to Jesus at night. His name is Nicodemus in John chapter 3, the first few verses. And, and he, he says to Jesus, Teacher, you, you've got to be a man come from God, because nobody can do these signs that you're doing unless God is with him. So what does he mean to come and, and give Jesus a compliment? Is, is he trying to be the bridge between Jesus and the rest of the Pharisees? Or is he just wondering, what, what am I seeing? What am I feeling whenever I'm around Jesus? Jesus told him in John chapter 3, verse 3, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus replied in verse 4, Well, how, how can a man be born again? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? In verse 5, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How is a soul purified? Well, there has to be a brand new start. There has to be brand new life. And Jesus calls it being born again. And here in 1 Peter chapter 1, when verse 22, it talked about purifying your souls by obedience to the truth. In verse 23, the same thing is called being born again. Being born again because of, by means of, the word of God, the good news or gospel that's preached to you in verse 25. We purify our souls by the blood of Christ. Now, that means that he's doing it. But not everybody's soul is purified. He doesn't purify everybody. He's not going to purify anybody who doesn't want to be purified. He purifies us when we become obedient to the truth of the gospel in the ways that we have seen must be the case in all these passages that have been cited. Now, a number of those passages had baptism in them. Acts twenty two sixteen. Now, what are you waiting for? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And Mark sixteen sixteen. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. And in John 3, 5, when Jesus says, a person must be born of water and the Spirit to see the kingdom of God. He's talking about the same thing. Well, then when I think more about what the New Testament says happens when I'm baptized in obedience to commands like that, I'm going to see a special connection here in 1 Peter 1, 22. Romans 6, 3 says that we are baptized into Christ. Acts chapter 2 verse 38 commands us to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. Or literally, that word translated for means into. Baptized into the forgiveness of sins. Now, think about those two things. Do I want to have something good, the best, with Christ? Well, I sure do. The more I think about Him... Well, so then I want to be baptized into Christ. 
Do I want my sins to be washed away? Well, yes, I do. I don't want that pollution burdening my soul anymore. So I'm baptized in His name for into the forgiveness of sins. That's what I want. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 also says, For by one Spirit you were all baptized into one body. Okay, well, slow down. What's that got to do with what I want? I want something good with Christ. I want my sins forgiven. Okay, baptized into one body. What do you mean baptized into one body? Well, Ephesians 1, and 23 tells us that the body is the church of Christ. And when we understand the church, biblically we're not talking about some kind of institution with all kind of hierarchy and rules and all that. We're talking about the people who are saved by Christ. Baptized into one body. Baptized into a group of people. Who said anything about any people? I wasn't asking for anything with any people. Was I? I wanted something good with Jesus. I wanted forgiveness of my sins. But whenever I'm baptized into Christ, whenever I'm baptized into the forgiveness of sins, I'm baptized into His body of people. That's by God's plan. That's God's new creation, the church. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Paul, or Peter preached that good news of Jesus who died, who was buried, who rose from the dead, sitting at the right hand of God. There's forgiveness in his name. Acts chapter 2, verse 41 says that those then who gladly received his word were baptized. And they were added to their number about 3,000. Souls, and it just kept happening. Verse 47, those people were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord was adding to their number, the church, daily, those who were being saved. God's never saved anybody since the cross of Christ without adding them to His church. That's the plan. That's the divine reality presented to us in the New Testament. So whenever we're saved... Whenever we get something good going with Jesus, automatically we're added by the Lord to His church. Now, where's that come from? What's that have to do with this passage? Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. That for a sincere brotherly love in the original, is that same word in Acts 2.38. That same word in Romans 6.3. That same word in 1 Corinthians 12.13. And whenever I was in, in Greek in college, first we learned a few nouns and verbs just to, to get functional at all in the Greek language in which the New Testament was written. But it wasn't very long before we learned the thing you better really learn if you're going to be able to do anything here is your prepositions. This one, ace, E-I-S is how we would transliterate it. Ace with the accusative, a, a case, means into. When you see the word for in the New Testament being translated from that word, unless there's some other reason to, for it to be otherwise, in a context it means into. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, into a sincere brotherly love. When our souls were purified, God introduced us into a sincere Brotherly love. That is, in God's plan, the church is the realm of sincere brotherly love, like the world doesn't know brotherly love. Now, has brotherly love always been a concept? Has it always been a feeling? Have you, have you seen it in people across all cultures? Well, sure. That brotherly love, that's, that's one word in the Greek, Philadelphia. And there are towns and cities across the world called Philadelphia. And, and, and we know Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It's not the flower box city. It's the city of brotherly love because that's what the word means. 
But God wants us to know that he's brought us into an environment where there's brotherly love like there's not brotherly love anywhere else. That's God's plan for the church. That's God's plan for all of us to be in the church where there's brotherly love. Brotherly love at a level, brotherly love from an angle like you won't find anywhere else in the world. Now, when we come back together tonight in our groups, we're going to look at some passages and talk about how they flesh out that truth and how we can flesh it out in our own lives. But here we are. This is the church's condition. This is the realm of brotherly love. This passage and and some of these others that we've we've talked about really tell us why whenever I start to hear about Jesus, whenever I start to hear about salvation, really quick, I need to start hearing about the church. The church is the body of which Christ is the Savior, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. But God doesn't have any plan for any of our salvations and a good thing going with Him apart from the church. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9, whenever Paul is writing back to the church in Thessalonica after he's been gone for maybe a year, after people became Christians there and the church was established, he said, Now, concerning brotherly love, I have no need to write to you now, for you've all been taught by God to love one another. Obviously, that was the teaching they received from Paul in the gospel from the very beginning. God's not going to save you and set you out there. God's going to save you and put you in here. People are going to love you. And you're going to love them. You're going to be surrounded by people who love because I first loved them. And you're going to love them because I first loved you. The way that's all reflected in 1 John chapter 4. You know, Jesus said in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, we've already said, love has always been known in the world. Whether the church is in a a culture or not. But Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. That's not new, but that you love one another as I have loved you. This is a a together thing in God's plan. I read about a, a group of American tourists. They were in Italy, and they were on a bus. And the bus stopped at a beautiful big basilica in a piazza and and let all the tourists off. Well, they went up the steps and they went inside and they got their tour and everything they saw was explained. They came back out and and when they did, the bus that was supposed to take them to the next place is is now on the other side of of the street. And this street had a number of lanes and, and that Roman traffic was just relentless. Well, all those tourists started lining up along the street like they were all going to take off uh, one at a time and and try to to dodge their way through. Like some of you all remember the old uh, video game Frogger. You know, it was just going to be like that, trying to get across that road. And the tour guide said, wait, 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 stop, stop, nobody, nobody step out there. And he huddled them all up, and he said, if you all start going out there one by one, you're going to get hit one by one. They're not afraid of you walking across the street. But if everybody bunches up, and we all go across together, they're going to stop, because you might hurt their car. God never planned for any of us to go about all of this individually. We're not supposed to do it by ourselves. 
And what holds us together and what makes us function the way that he wants us to function is love, brotherly love. And then at the end of the verse, Paul switches to another verb. Sometimes they don't mean as much different as we think they do, but it's in the noun form, that word agape, agapeo as a verb, but it's a commandment at the end. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. God, when he saves you, he puts you into this room where there's love like it's not known anywhere else in the world. But then he says, church, you make it what I made it to be. You love one another earnestly from a pure heart. That earnestly, that's about putting effort into it. Brotherly affection, we might say, well, that's something surely we'll come to feel, but I don't want you just to feel, God says. I want you to do it. I want you to make a choice. I want you to commit to it. And then I want you to act upon it. He doesn't want any of us to let any of the rest of us suffer alone. He doesn't want any of us to let any of the rest of us have to face temptation alone. He doesn't want any of us out there in that street alone. But all together, and helping each other to the other side, where we have our hope fully set, right? Church is how he's going to get us there. And it's not your job only to let people help you get there, and you need to let people help you get there. But it's our job to help everybody else get there. Do you hear what I'm saying? Let people here love you. Love the people here. And I hope there's not anybody who's already a, a part of this that doesn't have somebody here or a few that you really love. You keep on, and you keep doing that fervently, and you keep on investing in those people, but, but grow it. Get beyond just that one person, just that small circle. Who is that person you looked out across the room a little while ago, and you don't even know who that is? How do I love them? Well, you love them because God said so. But actively, how can you love them? Again, we'll be talking about that more in our groups tonight. But loving one another fervently, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8 says, will cover a multitude of sins. That means we are people who are patient with each other. We're forbearing with each other. We're forgiving of each other. We're persistent with each other. We just don't quit on everybody else. And we try really hard not to let anybody fall through the cracks. As we finish up, I'll tell you about a, a young mother who already had two sons with her husband. They were ages four and two. They were Ben and Brian. Mom and dad had just found out that she's pregnant again. And she went to the boys. And she looked especially at, at Ben, the four-year-old, and, and said, how would you like to have another brother? Well, Ben looked at his little brother, Brian, and he thought about it, and he said, well, I, I think we should just keep Brian Let's keep Brian, but there's plenty of room for more people, aren't there? To be a part of this love, God's love and our love for each other. That's God's plan for the church. We love each other, that we take care of each other, and everybody learns from us, God loves you too, and he wants to take care of you, and we want to help God the way he wants us to help.
and we want you to be a part of that. If you purified your soul by obedience to the truth, we, w- we want to urge you to do that this morning. <coughs> be a believer. Be a believer in God through Jesus Christ, as we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. Believe that Jesus really is the Son of God who gave Himself as a ransom for your sins. And you don't have to live in that pollution that you've brought into your soul. You can be forgiven. Repent of it. Confess your faith in Christ this morning and you can be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You get your sins forgiven. You get things going right with Christ and you get a family. A family that wants to be committed to doing their best for things to stay that way between you and Jesus all the way to the end of life. If you're a Christian, if you have been purified in your soul by your obedience to the truth, and you think about yourself, are you glad, are you really glad that God put you into this realm of sincere brotherly love? That word sincere, if if we put the Greek word for it out here, it's a compound, you'd see the word hypocrite in it. But this is a word that says it's not hypocritical. This is real love. You really been loving your brothers and sisters here the way that God wants you to? Is it sincere? Is it fervent? Do you aim to make your life everything that God wants it to be? And especially for the good of the other people that are here. Maybe that's an area where you are examining yourself this morning. and, And you see, I'm just not there. And I need to be there. And I'd I'd love for people to forgive me for not being there and and, and pray that, that God would forgive me and encourage me to love the way I ought to love. That'd be the kind of thing we'd want to pray for somebody about this morning. So you can be baptized into Christ. We could pray about you and your relationship with Christ and others. These are the kind of spiritual needs that we're inviting you to have met by Christ with the help of His church this morning. And if you'd like to come, come while we stand and sing together.